Also, I want to share the video from Mick Wallace. Um, I think he's a member of European par Parliament. Um, just like Claire Daly, he's one of the people that you see in Europe that constantly call out the hypocrisy of the West. And he's one of the people that call out uh, NATO in the West for their hostile position on China. If you if your position is you want global prosperity for the working class, the global war, waging a war against China is the most counterproductive thing you can do. You can tell the U.S. is doing what it's doing because they want blind, full spectrum dominance. They don't care the cost of that, right? They don't care how hypocritical they sound when they discuss this issue. And this is what Mick Wallace discussed. And then. And you guys see the title of the stream. Once again, Bernie Sanders. I wish we had Bernie Sanders that was on the Senate floor saying this stuff. I wish that I could do a stream where I'm like, man, look at what Bernie's pretty killing it. I wish I could do that. But instead, I got to look overseas and find a European leftist for you guys. So let's watch this clip. And I'm going to show you guys just how behind the ball Bernie is compared to other Leftist. And the thing is, I don't know this dude even consider himself a leftist. I just constantly see him speaking out against U.S. imperialism, which is apparently too much for Bernie Sanders, that is. So let me get into this video. Sorry, let me fix the audio. I'll get right. Our Irish comrades. In relation to security, um, you say that they're a security risk to the people of Europe. Um, I don't really see the evidence of that myself. And uh, do you accept the fact that the Americans last year spent 800 billion uh, on defense? It was more than the next nine countries put together, including Russia and China. Now you say that China is substantially building up its military forces. Well, most inde independent observers would see it as being more defensive than offensive. Uh, what would be your comment on that? And the last one, values. Now, I raised this with the sec gen of the EEAS yesterday, and he when I, when I challenged him on this notion that uh, there's a, a battle to be fought over values, he said, so, when speaking of China, so it is a model. Then we can decide whether we want to live in that model or in our model. That if we want to continue living in our model, then we have to stand up to the challenge that China is posing for us at this stage. Do you not think that we can actually have our values, our model, and they can have theirs? China is a very established culture, and they mightn't do things like we do them, and we don't do things like they do them. I mean, uh, do you not see a prospect where we actually can live in peace? Um. Before we get into that, guys, unhinged answer, because I'm going to show you guys this answer, just, just show you guys how, how unhinged the ideology of NATO in the West is. But you guys see how he even had to, he had to talk to these people like they're fucking kids. <laughs> you guys know that? He was like, you know, if you got a country, we do things differently than they do. So how about the fact that they do stuff differently than we do? That's not a good reason for us to fight them. It, you know how the same way a parent guy lecture their kid? You don't hit, you don't hit your sibling because your sibling has something that you want. No hitting, no hitting, no hitting, Josh. The same way that you had to lecture a kid Mick Wallace had to lecture global leaders on how peace works. <laughs> right. Ahead, you, have, you have two nations that, or, or two, say in this case, two, I guess he's talking about nations, China and the EU or whatever. But the point is that he's saying like, look, they have their own model that they're following. And there's, and the word that he didn't say, but it's almost in the background. It's like, they're a civilized nation with culture and a long history. And they do things differently, maybe on some things, they do something similarly. But at the end of the day, it's like, what's the motivation for going and as to use your example, what's the motivation for going and punching them in the face? What, what, why do we need to go and intervene? Why do we need to go there and uh, upend their model of how they're uh, building their nation and taking care of the region uh, when there's no need for it. Why can't we just have a peaceful relationship with China? What's the need for the aggression? And you're absolutely right. He's he's just posing. I liked it. I, I guess I felt like a kid at that moment because it's like, this is one of the clearest explanations or at least clearest questionings of why can't we just have peace with that nation? What is the motivation for us going to war? And that's where you get the unhinged shit about China's dominance and global aspiration.
if only we had Bernie Sanders saying stuff like that. This is very rational. Then I'm going to show you guys. Now I'm going to go back to the video because I'm going to show you guys his unhinged response. And he was making nothing but great points. And the point I made earlier in the stream that NATO, by their own stated mandate, is, is not a defensive alliance. It has never been a defensive alliance, ever. The, the same mandate they had to oppose the Soviet Union, it continues to this day, opposing China, imposing Russia now. So I'm going to rewind it just a little bit so you guys can hear Mick Wallace speak fire. And then I'm going to get to that guy's response. Because his response is insane. Insane. I don't want to spoil it any more than that. So I'm going to play the video because it's not too long. And I want you guys to hear Mick Wallace again. So let's go. Let's start from the beginning. In relation to security, um, you say that there are a security risk to the people of Europe. Um, I don't really see the evidence of that myself, and uh, we accept the fact that the Americans last year spent 800 billion uh, on defense. It was more than the next nine countries put together, including Russia and China. Now, you say that China is substantially building up its military forces. Well, most indep independent observers would see it as being more defensive than offensive. Uh, what would be your comment on that? And the last one, values. Now, I raised this with the sec gen of the EEAS yesterday, and he when I, when I challenged him on this notion that uh, there's a, a battle to be fought over values, he said, so, when speaking of China, so it is a model. Then we can decide whether we want to live in that model or in our model. That if we want to continue living in our model, then we have to stand up to the challenge that China is posing for us at this stage. Do you not think that we can actually have our values, our model, and they can have theirs? China is a very established culture, and they might not do things like we do them, and we don't do things like they do them. I mean, uh, do you not see a prospect where we actually can live in peace? Um, then Mike Wallace, uh, China. Well, and then as a, as a China is defensive. Well. So why do they then invest so heavily in new long-range nuclear weapons? Why do they actually deploy all these new submarines? And why do they behave the way they behave, for instance, in the South, uh, in, in the South China Sea? And then, well, of course, I respect that China is a different country than, than, uh, than Europe or Norway or um, the other countries in this room. But for me, some human right values are universal. The freedom of speech. It's not something we just have in the Western part of the world. It's something we believe that every human being has the right to do. So when they crack down on free press, arrest uh, journalists, writers, those who disagree, that's fundamentally violating values we all believe in. These people are insane and they are liars of the highest order in degree, right? So once again, Mick Wallace talking to him like a fucking child that he is. He said, "Hey, we had different values. The U.S. have values. China has values. How about we respect each other and form peace?" And he's like, "Nah, fuck that shit. If you don't believe what I believe, we're gonna die." He literally heard what he said, and then he responds like, "Nah, fuck that. We're gonna impose our dominance over them for they they got human right violations. Like, look at." We are in, in Florida right now, Ron DeSantis banned protesting. And fuck your vert. I know you. I know what you guys want to say. Well, technically, you can protest over there. Of a protest where you got permission slip from the government is a prep rally. What Ron DeSantis did is ban protesting. He essentially made it so you got to beg the government to show dissent. Do you got us crack down on Julian Assange? Us crack down on BDS protesters? I can go on and on over. Our, how we violate the free speech of our own citizens. So you guys see how he openly, from one, hypocritical, and two, he doesn't even address what Mick Wallace is saying. Like, you can't impose your belief on other. And his response is, yeah, we can. <laughs> Carlos, you want to chime in? Uh, this is just classic uh, Cold War rhetoric in terms of they are the evil empire and we're the good guys. I mean, this is what Reagan sounded like basically back in the day he used to talk you star hey, yo, wars analogies it? and like we are the 
the, oh, yes, you know, the evil empire oh, versus me. like the role <laughs> oh my and, god you know, we need to use the force audio so, issues kill me again like that they, they literally that's have a, to that's, rely that's on absurd irrational when compared to wallace's speech which is very rational it's like look this is them this is us there are differences but they're not major there's no reason why we can't be friends why can't we be friends and i love your summary it's like um fuck that and that's it you can just period it ends there what follows are just a bunch of rationalizations but at the end of the day it's just a big fuck that because if we're friends with them then we have to sit down at the table as equals and we're not dominant and that's what's at stake here it's european dominance versus the emergence of those that were left behind which is essentially what people call the global south or you know third world nations that are going to be led by these two nations that you know did what cuba did is that they're making it work and i saw it in the comments these are examples of political economic models that don't necessarily have to depend strictly on capitalism they can in, they can diversify they can be flexible in terms of what that economy looks like it means so that it can benefit the population entirely and not just one person anyway yeah uh well said carlos can you hear us how, how, how yeah i can hear you yeah, yeah. Good. all right glad to have you back glad to have you back so uh, hopefully you're doing well, Carl. We go a little bit long. Carl. There's a few things I definitely want to ask you about, uh, especially real, real quick. We can always reorganize a long conversation. But what we're just talking about right now is the whole China thing. And I, I know you, you discuss China all the time. So I would love to get your take on like the U.S. Uh, especially like I start with the Nancy Pelosi trip, the Taiwan trip. Yeah. The US trip. <laughs> I, I'm going to start there. We, we were talking about China as a whole. So I, instead of getting sped up to speed, I'm, let's start there. Like, what, what your take on the Nancy Pelosi trip to uh, for what? Like, for like, okay. The thing about the United, the thing that kills me about the United States is that like it, it, uh, it has a peculiar habit, and and like proponents of the United States have this peculiar habit of accusing other countries, um, other states of, especially like their uh, their rivals, uh, of doing exactly what it is that they they themselves are doing. So I've seen I can't, I can't even tell you how many tweets talking about how China wants to expand its sphere of influence, that it wants to take over the world, that it wants to mold the world in its own image that is trying to entrap other countries in uh through debt trap diplomacy and it's just like so you're just basically telling your people that china wants to do what it is that you're already doing or have done it, it like it, it's kind of mind-blowing to see how like brigitte Markison, uh who is like the uh, the eu's envoy to africa has literally talked about creating a transactional relationship between african states and uh, eu countries as far as foreign aid goes saying that uh, well if they're not willing to take our position on ukraine if they're not willing to oppose russia then we may have to uh essentially consider how much aid we're giving them and it's like what you, your 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 countries exist because they've extracted so much from african states throughout history you owe them the, the fact that mali has uh all of the gold in the world and they don't have gold reserves but france has no gold yet they have gold reserves they, they basically steal molly's gold and up until very recently we're in control of how they use it the, the like, it's just completely mind-blowing that people were talking would talk about like how cotton production in xinjiang is made with uh with with slave labor just like but the united states built its in like, its entire modern uh, industrial economy off of slave labor and off the cotton and indigo trades, uh, most of the most of the uh, the cotton that's uh, that's that's harvested in Xinjiang is done so with machines. It's like it, it, it's almost like they, they excise their own demons by projecting exactly what they've either done or are doing onto other countries. So Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan. It, it, first of all, the United States officially, in, in an official sense, yes. actually agrees with one China policy. Yes. Like the, its official policy is that Taiwan is part of the uh, is is part of the People's Repo Republic of China. So this idea that uh, Nancy Pelosi is going over there to support Taiwanese freedom, when most Taiwanese people themselves believe that they are part of the Chinese mainland, and they may have differences as to how uh, they're governed, but there there is no widespread popular support in Taiwan for a complete separation from the Chinese state. So to to to, to to go over there and provoke an international incident um at, at the very same time that you know her husband was under fire for uh for, for possibly insider training especially especially with yeah. regard to uh the u.s agreement on uh, on semiconductors that they've just reached with taiwan 
that they um that the United States has like for the past I would say like decade and a half uh called uh Chinese laborers exploited laborers why well because the goods that people buy in the United States uh especially like w with uh you know iPhones and other uh handheld electronics uh were made by uh, factories which by the way are located in Taiwan People are talking about, you know, these, these uh, factories that have suicide nets. Well, first of all, you're buying the electronics. Like, you're buying the finished products. You're buying those consumer goods. You shipped your entire industrial sector off to south of the border or across the ocean, and now you're mad at them for making the products that you demand in the first place, and you can't even get the countries right. You're blaming China, for example, for, like, for suicides at Foxconn when it was a Taiwanese company in the first place. So how are you talking about... This is like a you know the bastion of freedom in East Asia, and yet you're 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 deploring the conditions under which their their workers labor. Chinese laborers don't experience those kinds of economic conditions. The last the last time you could probably point to um, horrendously exploitative labor conditions that did require international attention was the uh, the the black kiln factory. And what happened? Well, people were arrested and executed as a result of that. Do you think that the United States? arrests or executes CEOs of companies that exploit their labor or exploit uh, workers' labor that put workers under dangerous conditions? Do they arrest billionaires? Do they just disappear? No. Like, this this whole thing is an absolute farce. And the idea that, like, there's Americans that are on board with this, they're talking about, well, you know, they, they talk about if China invades Taiwan, then this is a, this is a red line in the sand. Or even I was watching um, a clip from CNBC that when uh, China shot a missile over Taiwan, you know, they said that oh, the Chinese are just, they're stamping their feet, they're throwing a temper tantrum. But how the fuck do you think the United States would respond? Excuse me for swearing. How would the United States yeah. respond if some Chinese dignitaries landed in, like, I don't know, and this is, by the way, not a perfect analogy. It's going to break down for several reasons. But imagine that they landed in, like, ha Hawaii or Puerto Rico. to say, no, we believe in Hawaiian freedom and Taiwanese freedom. So, so like, you know, a, a high-ranking member of the uh, of the Chinese assembly landed in, in one of these uh, states or territories they landed in like Alaska or something and said so what why would the United States feel they have a right to, uh, to to sovereignty on your territory no 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 you you are your own independent territory how would the US respond to that are you kidding me so no. I, I don't know this entire thing is a farce and everybody that's going along with it just like they sound so stupid to me and can yeah. you imagine that with also a military escort cuz Nancy Pelosi basically arrived if i'm not mistaken was there 90 yeah. million yeah, 90, 90, it cost 90 million because she had yep. a military escort because she wanted to make a show of it. And you're right. It was provocative, but it's very interesting when you hear Blinken, I think, you know, talk about it. it's like, no, we honor the one China policy. We honor the one China policy. It's like, oh, what a contradiction. You got a politician who's undermining it at the same time that you're on the podium saying like, no, we don't want to fuck with China on that term. Yeah, like, have you guys heard her speak too? Like when she was speaking, it was directly contradicting that. She was saying we support... Taiwanese uh, uh, right to self-determination. And it's like, that's not the policy of the United States, you insane, mentally broken hag. And the world is a much, it's a worse place now because of what they did. I, I, way, I, to, I, way to, by the way, of all people to send over to Taiwan, I mean, way to convince the rest of the world <laughs> that the United States is not run by lizard people. Why the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I don't say Dude, I, I wish like, some video say the if you were going to try and send anybody to beat the lizard people allegations, why would you send Nancy Pelosi? And then she gives a great speech where it's breaking down towards the end. It's like, I can only imagine what the translators are saying. It's like, I don't know how to translate this nonsense <laughs> at this point. Like, yeah, freedom, you, us, ice cream, let's get out of here. And it's like, and it's the same thing. And just to your point, Nick. Russia has backed out of the International Space Station and the people that work up there are saying like, fuck, that was the last re working healthy relationship we had with we had with Russia was the space station. And now Russia's going to build their own, probably in conjunction with China, I would assume, in a few years. Yeah, man, people need to be outraged because the actions of our stupid, ridiculous leaders have consequences. I'm going to read this list and I just saw Kaylin Johnson, she mentioned, and she's on point here, which said, this, like, the, like, we in the worst spot as a global working class because of Nancy Pelosi's stunt. The stunt that she was, they were open. This is for her legacy. That's why she, she, like, she wanted to be the first speaker of the house since Newt Gingrich in the nineties to visit Taiwan. That's why that, that you want to throw, you want to completely throw apart global peace and stability, which 
they already prob and it was just a, another excuse for them no to they don't them. want global peace and stability because right now the united states has nothing left to export besides uh financier capitalism and war that's it there there is nothing else the united states has left to export it has to be it's war it's going to be a perpetual war yeah this is basically a version of the and this is why in terms of propaganda marvel released a whole fucking infinity war franchise because they were prepping on it's like there are wars that just have to keep going even if it's in different universes and different timelines it's like all right i guess war never ends yeah i, I definitely agree i've explained many times that we don't have a social contract like we're barely a country we are arms dealer <laughs> The United States is literally that's like, that's and that's exactly what I'm saying. The, like the United States has nothing left but financialization. Now, and, and keep in mind, like the Chinese banking sector. It's so funny too. I was talking to a friend that was saying that uh, uh, there was a possibility because of this. Um, what was it? The the new the new um, the new Hainan uh, Fortune Group. Uh, this uh, this this company that was apparently like scamming people out of their deposits and and uh, promising larger deposit interest than other banks were capable of. And I'm like, this is the second time in a year that I've seen uh, people in the United States speculate that some individual company is going to be able to collapse the Chinese, like the, the Chinese financial system. The Chinese financial system is, is, is like $395 trillion large. It is huge. They're not only able to finance their own growth and development, they're able to finance the growth and the development of several other states at the same time. So this idea that like, uh, the uh, that the U.S. is going to be able to, I don't know, like retake its number one spot uh, through financialization and uh, the export of arms and war. Like this is a losing proposition. the The position that the United States has taken, I, I'm talking about when I say when I say position, I mean like position in financial terms. Like the position that the U.S. has, like the stake that it has in global growth, development, and trade, is the same position that just about every other decadent empire has had before it falls. Now, do I think that like the U.S. is going to steadily collapse in our lifetime? I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that, but there, there is, there is no strength that they have left aside from bellicosity, from from belligerence. That's all they have. They don't, they don't have a strong manufacturing and industrial sector. They've already strip mined all of their natural resources down to the bare earth. They, have, they now have to rely on other countries exporting their goods. The biggest problem that the United States has right now, and this is why they find China so dangerous, Russia was sort of like a foothold into animosity with China. The reason that they find China so dangerous is because of the Belt and Road Initiative. This idea that other countries would be able to fully in industrialize themselves to be able to not only extract goods out of the ground, but be able to manufacture finished products, which requires a level of industrialization that the West has never allowed the global south to achieve in their history since since uh since since the uh the the colombian contact the the process of industrialization is going to cause spikes in carbon emissions that is absolutely true but the problem is the us and these other countries have basically called an end to the whole game they basically they basically said okay listen like we've developed ourselves to a level where we are now a post-industrial consumer economy we basically rely on service and real estate we're good so we're going to call we're going to call it off here. Carbon emissions, we're just going to cap that. You should not be developing yourselves. You should not allow other countries to finance you into developing yourselves into industrialization and subsequently post-industrialization. So any country that is uh, giving you the benefit or giving you the ability to determine your own fate aside from just giving us what we want out of the earth that belongs to you, we're going to call them enemies. And the Chinese uh the Chinese strategy here is to create a localized yet global uh, path to development and trade. What the Belt and Road Initiative is, as you, people from the West often call it debt trap diplomacy, no, it's, it's actually something way more dangerous than that to the West. What it is, is think about like uh, Nigeria, for example, right? And I, I would say like Western Central Africa generally, right? So look at the amount of track and road that Nigeria is laying down. So there was a road from Abuja to um, Kaduna, that was incredibly dangerous for people to drive through. Now they're building a railroad uh, to connect the capital city to a uh, to a smaller city in Nigeria that is highly traveled, but people are afraid to travel it by road because they could be waylaid by terrorists, bandits, whatever. Being able to hop onto a commuter rail line to, to travel between the two cities is actually going to save a hell of a lot of lives. That is being financed not only with Chinese money, but right now, at least, it's being uh, constructed with, for the most part, uh, steel and concrete from China. Now, why on earth 
would Nigeria need to import steel from anywhere? Why would they need to import concrete from China? Ethiopia, Eritrea have deposits that are capable of supplying the rest of the African continent with all the concrete they need. Guess what's happening right now? They're building concrete plants and they're building railroads in Ethiopia and Eritrea so that any other country that is looking to rapidly industrialize can buy from a trading partner that is on their own continent. That is the entire, that is the entire reason why the African Union passed that free trade agreement a couple of years ago. It came into effect January of 2021 so that they can help each other industrialize. And this is off, this, much of this is being financed, is being bankrolled by Chinese, not just the Chinese, but also, also being bankrolled by Indian Exim Bank. So having these countries rapidly industrialize so that they're not simply serfs that dig up goods out of the ground and then give them at a huge discount to Western countries, but they pull the goods out of the ground, create finished products on their own rather than shipping them all the way across the world for them to be manufactured into finished products and then re-import them at a premium, buying their own goods back. So if they want to, let's say, develop like solar and wind and hydrogen energy and so on, they can do it themselves rather than waiting for countries in the West to build it for them with their own natural products and then they buy it back at a premium. That represents a huge danger to the West because a globalized system, or at least a globally interconnected system where each country is able to determine its own fate, able to build their own social and political structure, able to manage their own economies and set their own terms with how they trade with the West that is actually what's dangerous. And that's why they're pulling all of these stunts uh, to, work, to, uh, to make uh, China and Russia look like the global aggressors because it deflects from the fact that they have benefited from the slave labor and from the natural goods on the African continent and from Latin America for decades, well over a century, ever since the scramble for Africa, ever since the Monroe Doctrine. This is how the United States, this is how the UK, how France and the rest of these these western countries i'm going to try and avoid as many slurs as possible on your on your show this is how these countries have been able to benefit and industrialize themselves and the idea that any of these people that they've seen as lesser that they've seen as primitive that they've seen as not contributing to western civilization these unwashed hordes now that they actually are controlling their own destiny this is the biggest threat to them and that's why you're seeing them pull these stupid and ridiculous stunts yes. for publicity because they've got nothing left yeah and just to speak to q's point this is why the, the United States uh, encourages instability around the world. This is why the, the, under, the United States will manufacture crisis because the only thing we have to sell is security because we are, as you said, a weapons dealer. And what China is selling is exactly that, self-reliance. We are trying to help you become self-reliant economically so you're not codependent on European nations or the United States, which you have traditionally been indoctrinated into believing that you are perpetually with these debts, with these loans, etc., and the fact that you are always a constantly developing nation china and russia's model especially china's like we can help you become self-reliant so that you can develop on your own terms by yourself on your own cultural terms and we're not going to dictate to you and let alone destabilize you in order for us to come and rescue you which is a u.s model we destabilize then we come in and rescue yeah uh the chinese envoy to uh, the horn of africa Zhui bing said less than two months ago said china is not interested in selling arms China's not interested in selling conflict. China wants to export scholarship and education is, is what it wants to do. And frankly, like that's what they have been doing. When they talk about things like debt trap diplomacy, ask yourself how many, how many countries on the African continent have gone in receivership to China and had goods seized from them, had uh, parastatal entities or public entities seized from them. What happens when they can't meet their debt obligations, especially during COVID? They were refinanced. What happens when... African countries could not meet their debt obligations under the IMF. It was basically just a fire sale. So give me a break. Like this, I don't know. I, I just, it's just really funny. My, my mother and my sisters were in Europe recently and they came back and I had a conversation with my mother and, you know, just, just turning on the, uh, the news and listening to it. She's like, I can't believe people are just so stupid that they listen to this stuff and actually believe it. And she says like, you know, maybe it's the, maybe one of the problems is that um, people are so monolingual and monolingual, um, like have, like speaking only one language encourages you to like lock yourself into a single mindset, not to open yourself up to other people's, if, if you speak a different language, you're by nature, uh, bringing in other people's mindsets. Like the, the, the nuances in language come from certain different mindsets and other cultures and so on. 
And because people just are so heavily assimilationist in the West, especially in the United States, Canada, et cetera, people will lock themselves into uh, monolingual culture. It's also monolingual thinking. And the idea that anybody could sit down, turn on the television, watch CNN, and see Nancy Pelosi, you know, having, having this, like, I don't even know what the hell to call it. I don't know if it was a summit or a conference or whatever. But just to watch her pulling this publicity stunt and think that this was an actual good idea, I'm sorry, but you just, like, you have to be, you have to be one of the dumbest people alive to look at that and see it as anything other than a flailing empire trying to hang on to itself or hang on to power by a fingernail. Yeah, and, and this is Rokana and the people that were defending it. And look, that's why I show you guys the propaganda that comes from CNN and MSNBC every once in a while. So once you guys get a dose, of left education on the channel, you guys can see what the unhinged people on MSNBC and CNN are also saying. And Carl, I know you want to chime in. Go ahead. Carl. I was just going to say uh, to Q's point that that's an excellent, excellent uh, insight in terms of how culture influences people's thinking. Franz Fanon writes a lot about that: how culture influences your perception of the world and what reality is, and you know that has everything to do with language. And languages, you know, cultures are built and founded on different languages. And the U.S. is an extremely hegemonic, English-only type of nation. And it not only makes us. And I checked out your webpage, and I really like the quote you have there regarding literacy, because essentially what what monolingualism does is limit our capacity for literacy, cultural literacy, if you will, and more importantly. Importantly, it makes us ideologically illiterate as a nation. We are not introduced yes. to other ideas from other cultures that see a way of achieving similar goals like surviving as a human being on the planet differently in a way that is friendlier. You're in academia. Towards... Isn't, that, isn't that by design? Because our revolutionary blackout sister, Josana, she, yeah. she speaks yeah. four languages. And I speak one because I'm a victim of U.S. public education. Yeah, you're you're. So I hear you guys. I'm like, man. I'm hey, gonna, no, there's there's I'm ways to. Work. You can fix that. You can fix that. I mean, I you know, I, I speak, I speak English. I speak French, um, against my will, but I speak French. You know, yeah. Yeah. Espanol as well. Like, I, you know, I I I speak Spanish passably, um, and, and I'm learning Arabic and I'm learning Chinese. And the reason for this is because I want to be like, it's not enough for me to read the translations. It's bad enough. The fact that like, if you wanted to get, uh, the, like, if you wanted to get a video of Putin's full speeches, you can, you will never be able to find it because it's not broadcast because in the West, we censor information. The information that we're presented with is not the full picture. It never is. And people are simply too intellectually and curious. Like we call actually, it's funny. We call it censorship. It's not exactly censorship because if you if you know where to look, you can actually find Putin's full speeches. You can find Xi Jinping's full speeches. Is that people are just intellectually disinterested in looking? It's like Kwame Ture said: they don't have to burn books in America. All they got to do is put them in a library, where nobody will read it, right? <laughs> but if you but if you speak different languages, like it's going to encourage you to want to look at the sources. If you can understand Russian, you will want to listen to Vladimir Putin's speeches. Doesn't mean that you have to necessarily agree with them. But it at least means that you're getting the full, like you're getting his perspective on why the conflict with Ukraine was necessary. You don't have to agree with anything or everything that Xi Jinping says, but you can at least get a Chinese perspective. You can at least begin to understand the differences in cultural thinking. And because Westerners believe that their civilization is superior, that there is nothing else to be considered, you'll hear people talk about like Euripides and Aristotle, etc. You hear them talk about uh, St. Augustine of Hippo. But you're not going to hear them quote from Arabic scholars and poets or from Chinese historians. You're not going to hear any of that because they don't have, there's such a deep rooted cultural chauvinism that they want a globally interconnected planet, but they want that interconnected planet to bow to Western assimilationism. They don't believe that there's anything to be learned from any other culture. That's why we find ourselves in constant conflict with these other cultures because nobody wants to adopt our way of life. Yes. It fucking sucks. It has to be multicultural diversity under capitalist neoliberal terms. And if it doesn't fit that model, then it is uh, less than civilized. And can you imagine, just speak to that point, if people did speak other languages or were encouraged to learn other languages, worker solidarity? I mean, yeah. they don't want that for a reason. Dude, I, I, I would be out of here <laughs> if I could, if I could speak. Another, I, I remember I was trying to learn Portuguese because I wanted to, to train uh, jiu-jitsu and Capoeira. I want to train in Brazil, 
Because we got good trans. Like, do you get five train capoeira? Teams? Don't train jujitsu. The capoeira, you'll find the quilombos. You know, they're they're cool, but the the BJJ people, they're fascists. So yeah, I don't even bro, know about all I, that. I learned that Gracie. I learned the Gracie support Bolsonaro, and that broke my heart. Like, oh, bro, the, the Gracie fan. Check this out. Did you know the Gracie family actually has ties to the Confederates well, in the no, U.S.? Come on, bro. Don't break my, no, come on. I'm not even joking, bro. I'm not even joking. Okay. You better when we yeah. stop saying just I'm going to put the samba at this point. <laughs> no, the Gracie family, their ancestors oh. were actually some of the original Confederates. God damn it. I should have stayed there. Yeah. It's That's funny. There was actually, no, there was a, there was a banking family. Um, one of them ended up, one of, one branch of the family ended up in the banking sector in New York and another member like a cousin ended up in the banking sector. I forget the names off the top of my head. Ended up in the banking sector in Brazil, and they both had the exact same fascist mentality. And that that strain of racist, like uh, that 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 ethnically chauvinist fascism, because like, you know that Brazil was like one of the most like yeah, it, they, it they, was an apartheid always, nation, they were right? Always light skin. They was they was that light skin yeah. Brazilian too. So well, I mean, it's not, it's not just that, but like Brazil was like one of the world's major slave economies, and it is it is and has been what like. Even though it has the largest uh, membership of the African diaspora outside of Africa, it's just an incredibly racist country, and that's because there are there's a, a strain of fascism that's been exported from Europe that sees Africans as undeveloped, like un underdeveloped minds, not capable of making their own decisions. And yeah, that that idea, those ideas propagated not only in the Brazil in in uh, Brazil, but in the U.S., partially due to the efforts of the Gracie family's ancestors. Wow. I remember uh, Josana Brazilian, our RBN sister, and I told her I, I wanted to train Jitsu in Brazil. And she had the same reaction you did. She's like, no, 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 no. The Gracie's here are fascist. Yeah. I'm like, and, I, and I'm learning about Brazil. I, I know a lot more about Brazilian politics. And, and, and your boy was a capoeirista back in the day. You didn't know that, did you? Who? You? you? Me. Yeah, I think I think I heard it before, baby. Yeah, I, when I lived in uh, when I lived in West Palm Beach and Palm Beach, Beach, Florida, I used to train with uh, Quilombo de Queimado. The, uh, as hell. I love Capoeira. Yeah. I, I know I yeah. do a little bit of the move, but I can't do like the crazy flips. I can I can I got I got oh, I, could. I got I got pictures, bro. I got I got I got footage. I got, got pictures. We gotta train one day, man. We gotta train one day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I did I did the because we had a Brazil Academy here. We got a lot of Brazil we got a large Brazilian community in Kansas City, a larger than mm. national average by a significant amount. And they got this community look they literally had a gym. Uh they call it Brazil Academy. I used to train up there with all of these old school Brazilians. That's why I used to be interested in learning Portuguese. And I remember I was learning Spanish for a bit because uh, I dated this girl for like two years and then she was trying to teach to speak Mexican. Uh, and then I like, we broke up and then I had like a salty breakup. So I was like, fuck that shit. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I was all down like, yeah, I'm gonna be, and I still know, like I can understand Spanish. My man didn't say, hey, fuck this girl. He said, no, fuck the whole Spanish language. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was fuck the here. entire Southern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> I was young. It was a salty ass breakup. Uh, I was literally learning her language. That's how much I was into her. It was a salty breakup. So I was like, I don't even want to learn this shit no more. But I need. I, I shouldn't have stopped. I shouldn't have stopped because I do want to become multilingual. Uh, multilingual. Uh, mostly because I'm, I'm not in love with this soil. People like, uh, you want to leave America? If you hate America so so much, to leave. I'm like, motherfucker. I wish I can speak the language of the countries I want to go. <laughs> That's a Big barrier. But anyway, I want to ask you one more thing because Savvy actually going to be live here soon. I can't go over her time. Uh, I, we was talking about the Ukraine conflict. I want to get your take on this as well, Q. Especially how, like, this war is not going out the way the West expected. Like, I, I don't know the U.S. expected, like, Africa and all the other countries. Just to <laughs> I actually think it's, it, I know, I think it's very much going the way the U.S. expected, which was, like, uh, you know, co here. coercing yeah. the EU into cutting their own throats. I'll, I'll add, to, add more to that. I would love to hear it. Well, because, like, you know, Germany operating on 40% energy capacity right now. Uh, Holland, like, putting pressure on its farmers to both, like, meet the the export, the uh, the agricultural export needs of the rest of the EU, while at the same time um, having to lower their carbon emissions, having to uh, um, uh, lower their nitrogen output that's ending up in, like, rivers and streams and causing algae blooms and so on. That's why the, the Dutch farmers were up, up in revolt. And a lot of people, like, we're saying that the Dutch farmers are like their landlords and that they're, you know, that they're, they're not actual workers and so on. And frankly, like, I'm not even really interested in all that, but like, look, look what's happening with the EU right now is that they are under a hell of a lot of pressure. This is going to be really, this is going to be really shit winter for them because their, uh, their, their staple crops are not, their, their staple needs are not being met, um, which they would normally depend on, uh, imports, uh, from Ukraine and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. 
um, and that they, they depend on natural gas and oil from Russia. Well, they're not, be, they're not able to get either. And so the partners that they need to be able to make up the shortfall are not going to be able to deliver on that. Like, where, where is Germany going to get uh, enough energy to power itself through this upcoming winter? Where is that going to happen? I don't know if they thought that this conflict was going to be over, like, hasta pronto. Like, you know, uh, the Ukrainians with, you know, uh, supplied by arms from NATO countries are going to be able to repel the Russian barbarian invaders. Do you think they're shocked? Do you think they're shocked by the response they get in Africa and some of these other countries? I don't... Th I think that they play like they are, but they absolutely should not be. No, 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 they shouldn't be, right? Because, because what, like, in what, at what period of history have African nations ever sided with the West against Russia as a bloc? Normally, they try to, normally they try to stay out of it. So, I, uh, I mean, maybe during like the neo-colonial period, you might have had like nominal statements in favor of like uh, NATO allied countries. But we don't live in that world anymore. So no, I don't. I don't know that they're if they're acting like they're shocked. I don't know why they would be. So and what, the what, the idea, the idea that like African nations are going to, like they're going to do the exact same thing as the EU and cut their own throats by coming out against. Okay, look at look at it this way. I don't know if you saw what happened with uh, with Haiti and Venezuela a while back. How like uh, Venezuela had this oil this um, oil subsidy program where they would provide oil at a dirt cheap rate and also provide uh, low interest and and sometimes even no interest loans. To African nations, um, they actually restarted that program. I think it was earlier this year, and Haiti, um, under uh, recently assassinated Jovenel Moise, um, they declared Juan Guaido the rightful president of Venezuela. And you know what happened as a result? Haiti got cut off from that oil and financing subsidy from Venezuela. Ended up cutting up, cutting their own throat. Did the United States come to their rescue under Trump? <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't fucking happen. So I, I don't know how like any I don't know how they would be surprised. Any country that was paying attention to how Haiti basically just like committed economic suicide, and that's why they were having all those the, those uh, those revolts over gas prices early in the year, is because they were not getting subsidized oil and gas from Venezuela. That's why energy prices were going up so high. That's why they had those riots, yada yada yada. So any African state looking at what happened in Haiti, why would they risk the exact same thing happening to them? by making a declarative statement against Russia. So no, they shouldn't be surprised. So there was two lines of thoughts that I had when I've been reporting on this. And I can see the merits in both. I honestly can see the merits in both. There's the argument that the West, they thought they can win this economic war. There are a lot of morons who thought they could and they made a bad uh, calculation. And then there's the, what it seems like what you're pr proposing. Make sure, check and make sure I got this right. It seemed like a controlled demolition. Like the West knew this was going to happen, and they've mm -hmm. been pre preparing for the new world order. Is that more like? Because I, I do debate this. Like, th did they tank all this shit on, on purpose, or did they know it was going to happen? They it seemed like you more on on the side that it was controlled demolition. Is that right? Read. The, okay, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset paper. Just read the paper. You know. Read, read, read about the Great Reset. Read about everything they were planning. Because I know people say that this stuff is conspiracy theory, but they wrote it down <laughs> in nice. books. Exactly. They told you what they were going to do. That's so, exactly no, true. like, yeah. When you quote them back to themselves, it's a conspiracy, right? It's like, when you show them, it's like, but you have a plan here. You want to destabilize Europe economically through this war with Ukraine so they become more U.S. dependent in some way. And at the end of the day, you're right. I mean, Germany is opening coal plants in anticipation for the winter because they know they don't have that that. Dependence they don't have the, the ability to meet their own energy exactly. needs. Exactly. Yeah. And, and nobody's so, going to provide it for them. And the U.S. knew that could happen. They knew it was a possibility. So what happens? I, I think the U.S. thinks that it's going to become, Europe is going to become U.S. dependent. Well said. I want, I want to get to the Super Chat. And then we actually got to get, get out here because I don't want to overlap with Savage Stream. I, this is a good way to end it. Thank you for 10 bucks. Uh, this is the first time I heard from Q. Anthony. And man, he's very informative. Just want to read more and more of his writing. I want to say that now because now there's a great chance for you to plug. That's a great transition. So, oh, I got a no. I got nothing to. I got nothing to plug right now. I actually have to. I have okay. I spent the summer basically being a trad dad, right? So I was just doing a whole lot of household projects. Got back into woodworking. I was just like just being. Uh, I was just being dad, like a suburban dad. You got um, I do have with, to get. Uh, we got a call-in show with Glenn, don't you? You still doing that? I do. Yeah, I have the call-in show with uh, Glenn Greenwald, unredacted, uh, which you can hear on uh, callin.com. We usually announce it. It's it's uh, usually Thursdays at 4:30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. 
Um, and then, you know, we have the, uh, the culture stream, which is uh, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Taking a short break, but uh, we'll be back uh, in full force by Labor Day. But yeah, like right now, I wasn't really ready to plug anything because we are taking like a, a bit of a, I don't know, like, I don't want to say hiatus. We're just like on a much lighter schedule now. Yeah. And plus, I haven't actually written anything for <laughs> a couple of months now. Yeah, I, I, I was taking the summer off and now like, you know, come Labor Day, I'll be back at it. And you'll, you'll see more, uh, you'll see more material from me. So look out for the sub stack, look out for the streams, look out for the call in show. Yeah. I need to release more on my sub stack, but between doing this show and then the call in, it's hard to, I need to get back on my sub, uh, on my new yeah. stuff. We also got to get you back up. So we had a long conversation. I, 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 we got to get out here though very soon. Carlos, same thing. Hey, man, you, can, you know, you can have me on whenever, like, yeah, I, I know you sometimes I'm hard to get a hold of, but <laughs> I, I know I can't be hard to get a hold of, but you can have me on whenever, bro. Just let me know when. Yeah, we gotta have a longer discussion here very soon, especially if there's so much stuff actually going. On. So we, Carlos, we, should, we should have a martial arts uh, discussion among the three of us since we're all. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Martial yeah. too. So yeah, we got. Hey, yeah. wait! Don't promise me these things, because uh, Carlos Za uh, a while back was saying that we have to have a, uh, a stream together about like uh, Hong Kong cinema, because that was way like I, listen. Hong Kong cinema was my jet in the 80s and the 90s. Your boy was heavy into the Dude, martial grew, arts flicks. Right? I grew up on Jackie Chan movies, bro. I love, I love all that shit. I, I, J -J bro, you don't know about me and the and the three dragons, okay? Me and <laughs> Jackie Chan, Samo Hung, and Yuan Biao, okay? He was like this, okay? We came together, we came together like Voltron back in the day. <laughs> I told on the, I said on the stream before, I told the story. I remember when I was a kid, I used to want to be part of the Jackie Chan stunt team. Like, I never cared about being famous. Like, I literally never cared about that. But I saw Same the team, and I was like, "Bro, yeah. that shit looks dope." It's Bro, I used to go to anime conventions dressed like Eddie Gordo. Okay, I was that. I was. I'm telling you, I was heavy in these streets, Carlos. Whenever, listen, man, we just met for the first time. I'm I'm down for that conversation whenever you want. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm down because I think there's a lot of correlations in terms of how one thinks when they're fighting in relationship to politics, and I think if people yeah. just understood, like. You need to understand what you're doing in the moment, and after a while, it's going beyond your fucking opponent. It's going to like enacting what you want to do rather than just reacting to what they're doing. And there's hey, a lot of that's the thing. That's actually why I've actually uh, that's why I've had a hard time sort of like writing and doing stuff lately, and I've had to like you know go back to stuff that's like fulfilling and meditative. You know, working out. Uh, so I train in Muay Thai. So oh, like so you know, I. hitting the heavy bag, huh? Oh, you do too, eh? Yeah, no, we, we, yeah. We I'm a second degree pro. Oh right no now. way! Sweat yeah. up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, do, like doing these things um, that are just like sort of like personally fulfilling and meditative to me. Like I've had to go back and do that because sometimes you find yourself in like the constant like cycle of hearing news and then reacting. And I think like we're just not meant to have this many reactions and this many takes to this many things at the same time. You really got to like narrow down and find your focus on what particular things interest you and then try to like look ahead. And it's just like you're saying, Carlos, it's like it's like the whole strike through the target or like control the opponents or control the ring. Yeah. Like you can't always be reacting to what is happening around you. Like all of these, you know, I, I, I know I joke about being on social media way too much, but like one of the reasons that I'll take like days off of it is because I'll just take some time and either read theory or read news that actually interests me and formulate a proper analysis to that because if you're constantly reacting to everything around you there's no way you could form a coherent analysis of anything absolutely and just and, and nick i know we got to get off but just to speak to that Go point ahead. we're falling for too many feints as fi if we were fighters right now as a population as working class citizens we're falling yeah. to too many we're falling for the feints and we're overreacting to the fakes and we're not paying attention to what's really a, a potential threat versus what is just a feint what is just a fake up but it's just meant to look like a threat so that something else can come in around it and actually cause damage. Yeah, we got we got to definitely have a conversation, especially I, we got to talk about how Capoeira was a martial art that came from resistance as a slave. yeah. slavery. Came from slavery, from slavery bro. bro. They they fought they fought they fought men on horseback with guns with Capoeira, all right? Yeah. It and would take a, more than it, was it would oftentimes take more than one uh, take oftentimes more than one soldier to take down one capoeirista. Yeah. Imagine that, unarmed. And my favorite I, thing is that they could hide it as cultural, spiritual practice when dancing, in reality yeah. it was martial fucking arts training. I said it many times. I believe that left need to train martial arts. Absolutely. I think, a, I think A1 need to train martial arts, and I'm, I'm like, we need to have martial arts mutual aid where we teach people martial arts around here. A lot of people can't, don't have access to it. Absolutely. That's, that's a serious. Yeah. 
that's a serious thing. Now we're gonna bring the light with our RBN chapter. Oh man, Look, bro, we all, we all, we all have to learn trades. Like we have to learn how to be able to to sustain ourselves, right? Yeah. Even things like I've been going around my house repairing bits of furniture, and I'm also like repairing furniture for other people because I'm like, stop getting into this whole uh, IKEAification of life where you buy something cheap, it falls apart, and then you replace it. Like, get furniture that lasts, and if something happens to it. Then you repair it. You don't just throw it out and replace it. That's what they want you to do. This this whole like planned obsolescence economy that we work on, this blank as a service that you're constantly paying for things. That's what they want you to do because there's this overproduction of goods. They don't want people to have things that last, neither physically nor intellectually or even culturally. They don't want anything to last. Everything has to be replaced every five seconds, and that that's like they. So we have to learn useful trades. I I'm big into woodworking i'm slowly getting into metalworking um but even learning things like you know carpentry electrical or whatever like it goes so far to be able to become self-sustaining and we also have to learn like we have to you know learn like uh like health and fitness and martial arts like you have to learn self-defense there should not be any if you're a you don't even have to be fully able-bodied uh to uh to be I able to practice martial arts killing it and just yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you, like, but the the left should be putting a focus on self defense, whether it's like armed self defense or unarmed self defense. Like we should all know how to defend ourselves. I was actually reading, a, and I know you got to go, and I'll, I'll make this quick. I was reading a um, a tweet thread um, by somebody in Toronto the other day. Uh, her cousin was, I guess, like walking down the street, and somebody was following behind him and shouting homophobic slurs, and then the person attacked him, and he called the pol he called emergency services, so he called nine one one, and fire showed up to see how injured he was and uh, have the paramedics treat his injuries. But he asked, "Is like, are the police coming? And they said, no, the police aren't coming. They, they decided that they're not going to take this call. He was just violently attacked and the police were like, yeah, no, we're not, we're not going to deal with that. But, but keep in mind, like the pigs in Toronto allowed Bruce Arthur, a serial killer, to operate in the village for years. And people in the gay community in the village in Toronto were saying, our friends are disappearing. There has got to be something going on. We believe that there is a serial killer at work. And Toronto police said, stop scaring people stop overblowing it turns out there actually was a serial killer operating in the village and the police knew who he was and did nothing did absolutely nothing about it so i'm like these people have no interest in protecting you whatsoever listen you got to learn self-defense because if somebody's following behind you and shouting homophobic slurs deliver the fate i'm sorry you just got to defend yourself if somebody's shouting homophobic slurs they're going to escalate to violence and they already they're already using emotional violence against you if you're responsible with physical violence hey that's on them you know they I, maybe they should, should they should have just shut the fuck up and mind their business i strongly agree we really got to continue this conversation pretty soon like probably next week or so because we got to, we got we got to have like a uh left conversation about martial arts i really believe and yeah, we, we can't rely on this thing and i and i literally just released a video a few weeks ago what where I, I was imploring i was telling black people and trans people in particular do not listen to these liberals who try to disarm us. But if you're a trans person <laughs> right now, yeah. with, the, with the rise of uh, anti-trans hate crimes, why would yeah. you disarm right now? Of all? Nope. That doesn't make nope. sense. But knowing right. that the police, knowing that the police are not interested in protecting you, knowing that people are looking to attack. Nope. Sorry. Nope. Find yourself down at the range and just make sure precision and accuracy. Okay. Two things that you gotta have: precision Absolutely. and accuracy. Absolutely. And just to, for people in the chat, just if martial arts builds confidence and it makes you less shy about engaging in confrontational situations through self-defense you're not going to be a bully but you'll feel more confident once that confrontation emerges you won't shy away from it you won't panic about it you're familiar yep. with it and that's one of the most important and all, like and the thing is too when you have like enough confidence like when you know you can defend yourself the thing is you don't even most of the more times you can avoid you don't it. even have to respond with anything because people exactly. can just get you know what yep. maybe i should yeah People yeah, can exactly. just get the vibe off you. Maybe I should just not push this any farther. Because you're comfortable with discomfort and people can almost sense that. It's like, I'm mm -hmm. comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm comfortable with pain. Are you? Yeah. And mm -hmm. suddenly you find out that they're not. That transphobic person is not. Who's chasing you or following you? They're not that comfortable with discomfort. Yeah. Trust me, guys. I got some stories regarding that. Trust me, guys. Like, hey, bro, like, listen. You know I, I, I have seen, I have seen, because like uh, the, uh, the academy that I first trained at, right? They started in Thailand. And I'm telling you, I mean, they had like trans women in Thailand that were training. They will beat the brakes yeah. off of some yeah. transphobe yeah. over here, bro. It will beat your ass, like. Oh, that JD Pond feminism—that's that's a that's something else. 
Bro, and I swear, we can talk about this all day. And I'm loving this conversation. We literally got to do this. Mm. Again. So I actually got to go because sadly we got to go, go, go live. Here. Yeah, man. So we definitely got to do this again. Um, make sure you guys check out the next stream. We got another more content for you guys. Always got great content. Savvy will be live uh, here at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, appreciate you guys for watching. Make sure you guys subscribe. Hit the like button. Support us on Patreon if you want some more content like this. And we definitely be back. Like I'm, I'm thinking here very soon, guys. So uh, All right, man. I'll reach All out right. and we'll be into contact. But thank you guys for watching. Uh, this is Social MMA. This is Revolutionary Black.